Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Derek Lambert. We're going to be talking about Scientology and some current issues that are taking place right now. But before I introduce our guest, who has a boatload of information, if we wanted to try and scratch a surface, we couldn't. We couldn't even begin when it comes to the Church of Scientology and the insanity that comes from that. Oh, I've got a delay here. There we go. All right. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and get us started with our intro, and then we're going to introduce our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision. Welcome back. I'm glad you guys are joining me live today. This is going to be the first time this guest has appeared on our show. And a lot of you are going to be probably jaw drop and shocked to find out some of the information we're going to be discussing today. So my guest is Tony Ortega. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, sir. Thanks for having me on, Derek. Thank you. I want to give a quick shout out to our friend Karen De La Carriere for introducing us and speaking so highly of you and saying you have enough information to really make my entire audience like, what? Say that again? So we're going to hear a lot of things that most people aren't aware of, uh, current situations that are happening in the courts, but who knows where this will go and where this will take us. If you guys want to ask questions, feel free to super chat. I will be here. We can, me and Tony can bounce off each other and have fun. So if you don't mind, who are you and what do you do? Thanks, Derek. Well, I'm a reporter. I'm a journalist. Um, and at the very beginning of my career, back in 1995, I, I just happened to fall into a great story about Scientology. And over the years, I just kept coming back to it. And then beginning in 2011, while I was the editor in chief of the Village Voice, I decided to start blogging about it every day. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, I left The Voice in 2012 to write a book about Scientology, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, which was about how Scientology terrorized a journalist named uh, Paulette Cooper. Uh, and uh, since that time, I operate my own website, TonyOrtega.org, where we have a new story about Scientology every morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. So we cover all kinds of different things about Scientology, uh, legal things, uh, history of Scientology, of course, Karen De La Carriere and her personal story has appeared in my writing over the years. And I just do my best to keep up on what's happening uh, with Scientology around the world. Mm. Let me uh, let everyone get acquainted with this for just a second. So here is his, um, what took me to another website, uh, TonyOrtega.org. It's down in the description. You guys can click the link if you're interested in like staying up to date. Uh, you can join it uh, and They'll send you emails notifying you each day because he does one every day on the current situations happening within Scientology. So if you're like one of those people who are really into it, like my parents are, you're going to want to know what's happening every day and what's the current situation with this cult. Also, his book that he mentioned, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, is on Amazon. I've added it to Myth Vision recommended books down in the description. CD, paperback, it's on Audible. You guys can get it on Kindle. Really, really good book. I've heard nothing but good things about it. Also, you can join my Patreon. And this is some Scientology material. So you guys see I, I do take jabs into this uh, area because I see the harms that come from such things. Early access to all that. You guys can ask questions, and I could try and interview some of these people. Asking your question, you can harass me privately. Uh, so <laughs> with that being said, Tony, I heard – if you don't mind me calling you Tony. Of course. Uh, I heard some stuff's going on in court right now. And one of the actors, uh, if you don't mind telling us his name and what's going on, I used to love this guy. Like I used to watch this guy on that 70s show. And and then, of course, down the road, there's other shows. There was this one about uh, farms or uh, like a Texas plantation type. Uh, I enjoyed that episode as well, those shows, if you will. Tell us what's going on. Well, Danny Masterson grew up in Scientology and uh, Yes, hit it big with that 70s show, and then subsequently he was on that series, The Ranch. But in 2017, I broke the news that he was under investigation by the Los Angeles Police Department for raping multiple women, that three women who had been Scientologists at the time of these incidents had come forward to the LAPD, and the LAPD was investigating that. Um, 
in fact, more women came forward and talked to the LAPD. Uh, and in 2019, these women were tired and waiting for charges to be filed. So they filed a civil lawsuit against Danny Masterson and the Church of Scientology for the harassment campaign they say they've been subjected to since coming forward. Now that lawsuit is in limbo right now and is being heard at the appellate level. But far more important for Danny and the church was that in June of last year, in 2020, the Los Angeles district attorney finally did charge him criminally for forcible rape of these three different women who were all, like I said, Scientologists at the time. And they charged him under this very harsh one strike sexual assault law. If he is found guilty of these sexual assaults, he's facing 45 years to life in prison. Mm. Uh, now that case was delayed and delayed. And then finally in May, there was a preliminary hearing. And at a preliminary hearing, the point is the judge listens to evidence to see if there's enough to justify a trial. So the burden is on the prosecutor to present just enough evidence to convince the judge. And it's not a full-blown trial. It lasted four days in Los Angeles. I was in the front row for all four days. And what one of the big questions we had going into that was how much Scientology was going to be a part of it. Because again, Danny grew up in the church. The three women were Scientologists at the time. Um, and, but we knew that Danny's defense was going to try to keep Scientology out. Well, it turns out these three women did get to testify live in a courtroom and they wanted to explain how their fear of Scientology had prevented them from coming forward sooner. And the judge allowed it. In fact, I was shocked at how much Scientology itself was on trial during those four days. The judge did rule that there was enough evidence to have a trial. She initially scheduled it for November. It's now been pushed back to February. It'll probably get pushed back again a little bit at least. But this is terrible for Scientology because it was bad enough that there were four days of test, yeah, four days of testimony, and all the newspapers were there in the courtroom with me. And there was a lot of coverage of these horrific allegations that um, he had, you know, forcibly raped these women, only one of which was a girlfriend of his. The other two were not. And uh, that's just a four day preliminary hearing. A trial, Derek, will last weeks. There will be weeks of this kind of testimony and not just from those three women. I suspect there will be other women testifying. Uh, about Danny Masterson, there will be his uh, other Scientologists and his friends will be dragged in. It's going to be a nightmare for the mm -hmm. Church of Scientology. Uh, and I have to assume there's got to be some pressure on Danny to prevent the trial by seeking a plea of some sort. But so far, he is acting like he's confident. He's, he's, he's not worried about the trial. Uh, and but he is facing consequences already. He's had his passport um, taken by the court. He's having to sell his Hollywood Hills home that is, uh, uh, you know, that he based his uh, bail on. That's keeping him out of jail in the meantime. Very serious consequences for him and for the church. And that's why I suggested to you a title of, you know, that the church is on a precipice right now. Now, when you say on a precipice like this, it's got serious allegations tying the church to what is happening with these rape cases. So if they would have just not bothered and let Danny face what he did instead of having involvement because he's a celebrity and they can't let celebrities just uh, give bad PR. Here we have him giving bad PR. They're in a way trying to mitigate the problem. Right. And by doing so, they're actually adding gasoline to the flames. Well, I mean, it's even worse than that because it goes back to when this all occurred. Um, you know, I mean, one of Danny's complaints and he, he asserts his innocence is that this all happened too long ago. The, 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 these incidents happened between 2001 and 2003. But to give you an example, Jane Doe one who alleged who was ne who never dated him, was not his girlfriend, but uh, she alleges he raped her at a party at his house. In April 2003, she, her testimony is she then went to the church to report it to the church. They responded by put her, putting her through 
Scientology past life therapy so she could figure out what happened in her previous lives, what evil things she had done thousands or millions of years ago that would cause her to be a victim in this lifetime. You see, in Scientology, anything bad that happens to you, including being the victim of violent crime, you must have brought on yourself. And this is how they condition people. You cannot go to the police. It's written in their policy. You cannot go to the police to turn in a fellow Scientologist. That's what these women were up against. And that's what the testimony was about in court. That's why I say it's really a nightmare for Scientology because it, it was bad enough in four days. But imagine weeks of that kind of testimony and every major news outlet examining Scientology's policies in a way that's never been done before. I mean, look, the game has changed because of people like Leah Remini, who has done such an amazing job at, at, at educating the public about Scientology's abuses. But this would take it to a whole nother level. Wow. So they're actually looking at the policies. And that was what I was going to ask you next was in the policies, if it's saying, do not go to the police, let us handle it inside. And it's in a policy and they know that this is part of their religion and they have to keep the policy for the religion to stay stable. What is that going to do? How is that going to affect the religion? And what are what kind of laws will that will that force into play by saying you cannot not you have to cut this out of your religion? I don't care if L. Ron Hubbard Hubbard or God himself said this. You have to get rid of this or else like what's it going to do? Well, it's already become a problem because the judge, Judge Charlene Olmedo, who I have to give her credit, she really studied the case carefully. She studied all the evidence very carefully. In her ruling, she said that, yes, the prosecution has provided enough evidence to justify a trial. And as part of her ruling, she said that the Scientology policies helped explain why the women had not come forward earlier. The judge herself is making Scientology part of the case. Mm. This and, and, and the other argument I made subsequently when I went back and looked at the transcript, it 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 became clear to me that look, Danny has Danny is spending a lot, or somebody is spending a lot of money so that Danny has the legendary defense attorney Tom Mesero, who you remember got you know Michael Jackson out of his. Uh, legal problems, and then also defended uh, Cosby and, and um, Robert Blake, famous guy with the Dutch boy white hair. Um, he he generally was very good in the courtroom, but there were a couple of big mistakes he made. And I realized looking at it subsequently that all of their missteps have been with the Scientology material. And it's it, it appears to me that either Danny or Mesro are allowing David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology to call some of the shots in the defense. And it ba it has backfired on them every time. Hmm. So that's not good going into the trial. I mean, Scientology uh, knows that it's on trial here, and it's going to get worse and worse. This is – I don't know, man. I want to see something happen here. So just for our audience who knows, Danny and his last name again? Masterson. Masterson. So he's a famous Hollywood star. He's been on many shows is not only been accused, but has been charged with raping of three women. And there's more women than that, that have come forward. And this guy's obviously definitely guilty of these three for sure. Um, uh, no, don't say that. Don't say so, that. So they he, haven't. He's, he's innocent until proven guilty. Oh, I thought he and, was proven guilty. Okay. He's been charged okay. and he's now been bound over for trial. But he has not been convicted of anything, and we have, you know, he does get a defense. He deserves yeah. a defense. Well, I agree. There, I I saw their defense in in person at the at the uh, preliminary hearing, and it was basically what usually happens in these kind of cases. They just try to call the women liars. I mean, that's just basically all they have. Um, I think in the trial itself, I mean, some you'll also see people online saying, "Oh, it's just she said, he said." It's not. There is documentary evidence which I believe will come out in the trial that makes things even worse for Scientology. So, um, yeah, he, we have to be careful. He maintains his innocence, and he's not been convicted of anything, Derek. Okay, got it. Well, now I'm getting educated on what's happening here. So I agree with you as well on that. I mean, I, 
I understand from how that happens in our court system, especially anyone deserves the right until they're proven guilty. But what else would you say puts Scientology on a precipice on top of the fact that we have this court situation happening? It's like they're constantly dealing with something that doesn't look good for them. I would say the other big problem Scientology has, um, there are some that are acute and some that are chronic. Uh, on the acute side, I would say the pandemic has been very difficult for them. Um, Scientology is an organization that really banks on person-to-person -person contact and convincing people to come in, give up the secrets of their lives, invest themselves in the books and, and, and products that they have, and that all got shut down by the pandemic. Now they they did their best to you know um, make a big show about how okay everyone's got to do courses at home now because you can't come in. And um, they you know they they've done their best to to make it look online at least like they're doing to their own members to prove to them that everything's fine, no problem, we'll get through this. But you know Mike Rinder, for example, in particular, runs a website where he does a very good job at looking at evidence of staffing levels and activity. I'm, I'm able to uh, publish a certain amount of that as well at my website of internal documents from the Church of Scientology. And, you know, as someone who has looked at this for decades now, I can tell you that things are very much at low ebb for Scientology right now. They are really struggling to keep people in the fold and I think part of it is just that, you know, a lot of ex-Scientologists come out and they will tell you that you are under so much pressure constantly to give money, to take courses, to go to meetings. Once you leave, that pressure comes off and you're able to look around and see the world and realize, wait a minute, maybe L. Ron Hubbard wasn't the only person who had an idea in the world. Mm. I think the pandemic has given an opportunity for some Scientologists to maybe look around who normally wouldn't. So I think the pandemic has been very, very difficult for Scientology. On a more chronic side, Scientology has been shrinking, there's no question, at a steady rate since the early 90s. Um, as far as, you know, they, according to the top executives that I've talked to over the years, the high water mark was probably around the year 1990. I, you're probably too young to remember this, Derek, but in the 80s, there was this there was this really catchy television ad featuring an exploding volcano, erupting volcano about the book Dianetics. That ad was actually created by a Scientologist named De uh, Jefferson Hawkins, and it was hugely successful. Dianetics sold so many copies in the 80s because of that television ad. And so by the end of the 80s, in 1990, Scientology was probably at its biggest size. And, and the best estimate is that was about 100,000 people. Wow. They've never had the millions they've claimed. Nothing like it. Maybe 100,000. But it's been steadily, in 1991 is when Time Magazine had its devastating cover story about Scientology. And Scientology has been shrinking ever since. Uh, in 2012 or so, Jefferson Hawkins estimated to me that the total Scientology membership was probably down to only 40,000. Hmm. But then a man named Paul Burkhart came out. He was a top level Scientologist, had access to enrollment documents. And in 2015, he estimated to me that it's down, down to 20,000 or fewer. And it's only been even tougher since then. It's really hard for Scientology to recruit now. Uh, because of all the stuff that's on the internet. So that overall decline with the pandemic and now this terrible publicity because of Danny Masterson, I think is making things very difficult for Scientology right now. <laughs> this reminds me of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's the same thing. Like their numbers are shrinking. They actually reported a, like a, they didn't grow at all this past year. And it's like, you actually reported this. Like you would think they would have fa fabricated those numbers. I suspect they probably will the next time, just like Scientology likes to fabricate theirs. I mean, they literally fabricate on another level. You know, <laughs> take a picture of some kids, kids in Africa with them. And they're like, we have 30,000 over here and we have 100,000. And it's like, what? Well, they're the, the president of the Church of Scientology, not the leader of Scientology, Dave Miscavige, but the nominal president, Heber Gentsch, 
was put under oath in 1999 in a deposition. And he was asked this question, where are you getting the 6 million figure from? 6 million, 8 million. That's always the numbers they used to use. And he admitted under oath that it was a number they came up with adding up every person who had ever taken a course or bought a book since the beginning in 1950. Go figure. And, and even then, I guarantee you it was an exaggeration. So it had nothing to do with active membership. Which again, like I said, is is on, is in the is in the tens of thousands. It's a I tiny think, organization. Based on that, I wonder how many Christians live on planet Earth. You know, it's like how many people read the Bible. You know, if you bought a Bible, you're a Christian. Um, not necessarily, but anyway, thank you, Mister Monster, for the super chat. He says, "I am Lord Zenu." So Zenu's in the chat, ladies and gentlemen. If you're wondering who Zenu is, maybe that's an interesting question I can ask you briefly. You mentioned this volcano and this. Uh, I think there's a subliminal message to their secret teaching in that probably. I mean, there's no reason why um, an erupting volcano and Dianetics here on the TV isn't going to trigger this science fiction writer's weird uh, science-y origins for humans going back to this uh, leader named Xenu. Who's Xenu? What is going on here? Yeah, Hubbard actually said that, that, that he put images on the covers of his books specifically to re-stimulate memories that you and I and everyone have from millions of years ago that we're unaware of. Um, Hubbard's cosmology is that the universe is not 13.8 billion years like sci old, like Scientologists, I mean, not scientists say, but that the universe is actually quadrillions of years old. And uh, you and I are actually immortal thetans, uh, which have been around for 76 trillion years or, or much longer. And we just don't remember the fact that we've lived countless lifetimes going from one body to another year after year. So um, part of Scientology is, is going through this counseling in order to retrieve those memories of what happened to you billions and trillions of years ago. Now, on that time scale, in a more recent time, only 75 million years ago, Hubbard uh, reveals in, in an auditing level called Oper uh, OT3, um, there was a galactic overlord named Xenu who was in charge of 76 planets somewhere, and he had an overpopulation problem. And so he took a, he tricked a bunch of people into coming in for tax audits, uh, froze them in a glycol solution, put them on spaceships that looked something like DC-3 airplanes, flew them to the planet Tegiak, which today we call Earth, put them around volcanoes, and then sent hydrogen bombs in to explode and vaporize everyone, but then captured their thetans, captured their souls electronically, subjected them to 36 days of 3D movies in which they were implanted with all the ideas of all the modern religions, including Christianity and Hinduism and Islam. These are all just fabrications by Xenu. And then set those disembodied souls onto the earth. Well, of course, there were no human beings here 75 million years ago, according to evolution. And so, you know, they were in various creatures. They were in clams. They were in other, and they finally ended up in human beings. And so today, part of what you're trying to figure out is... Uh, by the time you reach OT3, Hubbard reveals to you that there are hundreds or thousands of these disembodied thetans, they're called body thetans, attached to you and hovering around you. And they're still angry from that genocide 75 million years ago. And so you spend OT3, OT4, OT5, OT6, and OT7 years at about six to $800 an hour locating and driving away these invisible beings called body things. That's what, oh, that's what Scientology is at the upper levels. Xenu, meanwhile, was captured by some loyal officers of the gal galaxy, I don't know, force or whatever, and he was imprisoned in an electronic prison in a mountain somewhere. So that's, that's all we know is that Xenu is still in prison somewhere, but all those victims from his genocide are stuck to you and me and you can't get rid of them unless you go through Scientology. And, and that's literally what, when you see Kirstie Alley holding up an OT8 certificate, and I have that, you know she spent years and years on OT3 through OT7 
removing invisible body thetans from her person. And That's all it is. Money did she remove as well? Oh, she it's. Was. I mean, it's it's millions of dollars, millions of dollars, and years of your life. I've talked to people that spent twenty years on OT seven. OT seven is the toughest one. Twenty years. Leah Leah Remini's mother. I think she said she spent twenty years on OT seven. And you know, they can't deny it. All those all those uh, documents have been entered in court cases. And every single upper level Scientologist that comes out will say, yeah, I, I, I read the Xena material on OT3 and yeah, I spent the next six years getting rid of body Satans. I mean, there's not a single upper level Scientologist that comes out and says, no, we do, we do something completely different. No, it's all consistent. So uh, anyway, welcome Lord Xenu. We're glad you're in the room. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I hope that put perspective for those viewing on the teaching and you saved millions of dollars. Well, and let me just add a couple of little facts well, to that. Uh, you know, South Park gets a lot of um, uh, credit for turning that into a cartoon in an episode in 2005. But really, it was the hardworking journalists like Richard Leiby and the journalists at the Los Angeles Times, Joel Sapel, Robert Welkos who revealed this stuff back in the 80s, actually, for the first time to the public. And a, and a former Scientologist um, had actually written about it in the 70s, but very few people saw it. <clears throat> anyway, so the important thing to remember is Scientology thinks the universe is quadrillions of years old. So Xenu being 75 million years ago is actually fairly recent. So it's a mistake to say that it's an origin myth. It is not an origin myth. It's actually relatively recent. And the second thing to keep in mind is that people make a mistake and say that he's sort of like their Satan. It's not true. He's a minor historical figure that helps explain why you have space cooties. That's it. He's not the devil. He's not Satan. He's not a god. They don't worship him. In fact, you want to get, you know, some Scientologists will tell you that in their 30-year career, they might have spent a single afternoon on the Xenu material. It's like just a blip. But they do spend years and years on that body Thetan nonsense. That's a, uh, it's crazy how people can create such things and people believe it. I'm, I'm fascinated at knowing that and why people believe. I think it's funny that this fiction developed by L. Ron Hubbard becoming a religion is something that even in this, it incorporates why other religions exist and why uh, people believe in them and it has well they watched on this uh tv uh, you know, projector and you guys were all indoctrinated your uh to believe in christianity and this and that and it's funny because justin martyr kind of had this interesting explanation as an early church father for why jesus looked similar to dying and rising gods from the greco-roman world well satan knew a long time ago now i'm just saying justin martyr you know satan knew a long time ago and god you know these were sent as tricks to like steer people off their path and it's like Come on, guys, what are you doing? It just it's the repetitive trick that I see everyone use over and over and over. So whether it's Allah is like make you know trying to uh, make people disillusioned on what's true by making people think Jesus was crucified, but he really wasn't. like there's so many tricks I think, I think with, I think with Scientology, uh, one of the things it's it's answering for people is I think people have a hard time with, uh, I don't know why, I think it's a magnificent, fantastic natural discovery and that were, you know, these animals that evolved in a certain way on a planet and we, we live a short time and we do our best to may have a fulfilling life. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I think so. But for some people, that's so disappointing. They don't, they don't want to think of themselves as, as you know, what we are. They want to be part of this larger, grander, galactic narrative. You know? And that fuels so many of these kinds of you know, conspiracies and, and, and offbeat religions is People are not satisfied with simply being a human being, which, you know, to me, nature is amazing. And 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 I'm so glad I, I get to experience it and learn about it. But for some people, that's just not enough. There must be some larger reason. There must be some bigger story. And Scientology feeds that because, you know, a lot, a lot of people ask me, so why do celebrities get involved? And, you know, they do have some celebrities. They've had the same celebrities for a long time. They don't really recruit new ones. But um, I, I try to explain that one of the big differences between Scientology and other organizations is 
you know, when you go into a church or a synagogue or a mosque, you're going into a group activity and there's a minister or a priest or a, or a rabbi. And what are they doing? They're talking about something that happened 2000 years ago in the Middle East, right? I mean, you're, you're supposed to be learning this legend and lore from, from 2000 years ago. It has nothing to do with you. And they need to convince you that it does have a lot to do with you. Right. Scientology is complete opposite. Scientology, you walk in from day one, everything is about you. What do you remember from your life? What do you remember from your previous life? Tell me everything that happened in your childhood. What can you remember from a thousand years ago? You, you, you. And they can never tell you that you're wrong. It's one of the cardinal rules in Scientology. You could say, you know what? I'm pretty sure I was Julius Caesar. They cannot say, you know what? That's probably, you know, you were probably in his <laughs> Praetorian guard instead. No, they cannot tell you you're wrong. And so people imagine these amazing, incredible pasts from thousands and millions of years ago. And, you know, the, that's why OT, in fact, that's why the Xenu thing in OT3 is actually unusual because it's the only time in that years and years of experience of digging up your past that Hubbard comes in and says, oh, accept this one thing that happened to everybody 75 million years ago. You need to learn it because it's affecting you today. And that's a shock for a lot of Scientologists. Not that it's space opera, not that it involves a galactic overlord, but that Hubbard is telling you what happened to you 75 million years ago. Most of the time, Scientology is you telling them what happened. And for some people, they feel like they're the star. You know, I'm the star of my galactic narrative. Let me tell you all about the planet that I ruled for 2 million years, you know. Yeah, and it's confirmation. Like, they, like who wouldn't want to be pat on the back and, like, encouraged? But simultaneously, there's some tricky things uh, that happen here. While they get you, you know, this, uh, what would you call that, uh, the sugar effect, uh, placebo effect here. They have you so enriched and they're, they're getting the chemicals cooking in the brain. And you're so happy to tell them everything. They're really jotting down and noting all of these horrific things as well. Uh, that we can use that if we need that. Uh, like my mom and dad asked me the other day, they're big fans of Karen when I have her on and I do these interviews. And I'm going to show them our interview here. They ask, they say, you know, what about John Travolta? Like, what about Tom Cruise? What about these big guys? Like, everyone hopes. You write about this every day. And, and on your blog, it's there. It's like, go to the website, you know, TonyOrtega.org. It's in the description. But in that, it's like, why, why isn't Tom jumping? Why doesn't he just leave? What do they have on these guys? Well, a lot of people like to believe, especially the tabloid press, they like to believe that Tom would love to get out but that they have all this dirt, you know, this dirt on him. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true they have dirt on them. They definitely do. And Tom Devot has talked about actually watching, you know, when, when you go through these auditing sessions, they're recording it. And Tom Devot has said that David Miscavige, a leader of Scientology, who's supposedly Tom's best friend, was playing back Tom's videotapes discussing his most private sexual history and stuff. And they're drinking scotch and laughing about it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they definitely have dirt on these guys, but I think it's important to understand that that's not what keeps Travolta and Cruz in. They are true believers. Tom Cruise. See, whenever, when somebody says to me, I can't believe Tom Cruise believes this stuff. Right. I try to make them understand. He can't believe that you don't understand that Scientology is the only salvation <laughs> for this planet. He, he thinks you just must be an idiot. Yeah. And, you know, once you've convinced yourself that Scientology is the only solution and that this is a prison planet and the other people just can't see it, that's a powerful idea. And it's hard to give up an idea like that. That's well put. I remember being extremely delusional in my own thinking and thinking the same way. And then light switch goes off after some time and you don't even know how. It's, it's, it's kind of like waking up. Whoa, what the hell? How did that? it's gradual for me, but, um, yeah, I mean, I wonder about Tom Cruise and John Travolta cause they're huge names. Do you think any of them, and this is a speculation, do you think any of them at some point are going to leave? Well, Travolta has had doubts. We know that for sure. There have been some high level defections. Of course, Leah Remini is the most well known because she not only, I broke the news that she left in 2013, but she not only left, she made noise about it. She was unhappy. 
She wanted people to understand what's going on. She wrote a best-selling book about it. <coughs> Sorry. She had a television series about it. I mean, she's done an amazing job um, bringing a whole new audience to the controversies and abuses of Scientology. And I, at one point, a couple of years ago, came out with a story. I had a good Celebrity Center source, and we put together a list of which of the celebrities might actually leave and which ones are bitter enders and will never leave. So Beck was actually on my list as someone who might leave, and he did. He left uh, a year, two years ago. He just casually dropped in an interview with an Australian newspaper. I'm no longer part of Scientology. That was very strategic. He's not like Leah Remini. He's not going to give any interviews about Scientology. He has no, he's not going to try to criticize the church. He just wanted it known he's out. And he did it in the most painless way he could do. Now, Laura Prepon has done the same thing. I had her on the list of people that would never leave. So this was surprising. I got to go back to my celebrity source and see where we went wrong on that one. Mm. But, um, she recently told People Magazine that she's been out of Scientology for five years. My sources are telling me to be a little skeptical about that because of the situation with her and Danny Masterson. They were very tight, of course, on that 70s show. They remain friends. Um, he's facing life in prison. I think there's a lot of things to consider about why she has chosen now to come out and why specifically she said five years, which would put it before the first allegations came out about him. So uh, I, I think like Beck, you're probably not going to hear much more from Laura Prepon about Scientology. She's made her little announcement and she's hoping it'll just wash over. But, you know, there are others that, I mean, I think that Michael Pena, Juliette Lewis, Erica Christensen, uh, and maybe mostly Vonnie Rabisi, are people who possibly could walk away. Uh, Giovanni Ribisi, you know, the actor, uh, Sneaky Pete, you remember? Um, his daughter went on a radio show and said that he has questioned it. So I think there's a possibility that he might walk away. But then there are other people like Kirstie Alley and uh, Jenna uh, Elfman and, um, you know, uh, well, of course, Tom Cruise and John Travolta, that I just think they're just true believers. They just can't imagine being away from this. The tabloids love every six months to tell you that Tom has left, but I, they, they, always, they never have any evidence. They always cite these insiders that never seem to exist. It's all just selling the tabloid. They're trying to make some money there or at least get attention. Um, one of the guys that I, I – you're just the guy to ask this to – I remember watching on the news, there was like screaming and yelling between a reporter and I cannot remember the gentleman's name. He was one it's of the between two. John Sweeney and Tommy Davis. Whatever happened to Tommy Davis? Because he is silent. As far as I know, I right. don't hear anything, but he is not part of it anymore. Tom, well, Scientology, David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, has had different um, strategies over the years for how to deal with the press. In the 80s and 90s, uh, he used Heber Gentsch, who was the president of the Church of Scientology. He had been an actor, a small-time actor. He he was um, he he really tried to form relationships with reporters, and he was friendly to them. But then, he, of course, he would act fiery about Scientology. He was pretty effective for a while, but um, he fell out of favor. Then, in um, t around twenty oh, mm, I want to say twenty oh five or so. Um, Miscavige put Tommy Davis out there. Tommy was is the son of Ann Archer, the Academy Award nominated actress. He he grew up in Scientology, and his father's very wealthy was a very wealthy real estate guy. He was Tom Cruise's gopher for a while, uh, and then suddenly Miscavige decided to put him out on the stage as sort of the spokesman for Scientology, and as opposed to Heber's sort of friendly. Uh, approach, it was clear that Tommy's orders were to get aggressive with the press. And so he had these epic arguments with uh, Martin Bashir at ABC and um, uh, John Roberts at CNN. And the most famous, of course, was John Sweeney at BBC, who, who in 2007 and 2010 put out a couple of great uh, shows about Scientology. 
And they were they were following Sweeney and gaslighting him and to the point where he finally just blew his stack and screamed at Tommy. And everyone's probably seen that video. Well, then in uh, to, then Lawrence Wright came along. OK, the, the writer for The New Yorker. And Lawrence was documenting um, Paul Haggis, the director, leaving Scientology. And um, his article came out of The New Yorker in February 2011. So in 2010, Larry Wright was putting that together and was working with, you know, The New Yorker was working with Scientology and Tam Tommy Davis to try to get answers to things. And Tommy said some really stupid things to Lawrence Wright. One of the things he said was that you know, L. Ron Hubbard had been injured in the war and um, Dianetics was how he figured out how to heal himself and heal the world. And if he wasn't injured in World War II, then Dianetics was a fake. This is this is Tommy Davis saying this. Mm. He had kind of set himself up because then Larry got a hold of Hubbard's actual military records, not the fake one put out by Scientology, and proved that, no, Hubbard never was injured in World War II. So... That was just a really embarrassing line for Tommy. Now, like I said, that story came out in February 2011. I found that in March 2011, the Church of Scientology had purchased the URL, who is Tommy Davis. That's the one of those smear websites they will create. That told me that Tommy had had his head chopped off because of the Lawrence Wright article in February 2011. He and his wife resurfaced a couple years later in um, uh, Austin, Texas, and then then moved to Los Angeles in 2014. He gave a deposition in a lawsuit saying that, yeah, he was no longer in the Sea Org, but he was still a Scientologist. And he went to work for a guy named Tom Barrick, who's this huge real estate guy in Los Angeles who's now under federal indictment for... Um, what was it, it um, aiding the government of the United Arab Emirates at the United States expense or something crazy. Oh, anyway, he, he was one of the, he was probably the biggest fundraiser for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. And, and he was behind the inaugural. Anyway, Tom Barrick, big real estate guy was one of Tommy Davis's father's best friends. And so that's where Tommy, Tommy always falls upwards, right? He was, he was working in the Sea Org for David Miscavige. Now he's, He's working for Tom Barrick. I'm sure he's making a ton of money. Briefly, he went to work for James Packer, the Australian billionaire who had been a Scientologist for a while, who owned a mini Hollywood studio called Rat Pack Entertainment. And in 2016, 2017, Tommy Davis became a mini Hollywood mogul and was actually running the studio for Packer. Then everything fell apart for Packer. Uh, um, um, uh, What's her, um, Carrie, um, the, the singer, God, I'm blanking on, anyway, um, it, Packer's life fell apart and he, Tommy lost that job, but he went running back to Barrick. So he's back with Tom Barrick now. The other day, Barrick was hauled into court for indictment and photographs captured Tommy walking with him. So he recently got remarried. He and his wife had divorced and he's now on marriage number three. I think he married an Egyptian actress lovely woman. They had a fantastic wedding. I featured some pictures of it at my website. So Tommy's doing fine. Don't worry about Tommy, but his days of being Scientology's fiery spokesman are I just wish he decade had that. old now. I was going to say, I wish he had that against the church. Oh, if he was that outspoken, you know, that would be amazing to see a guy like him as a firecracker against it. Um, have you ever been fair gamed? And this is a question one of our commenters asked because that's what they do. Uh, we, If you're watching this and you know anything about Scientology, you know they don't play clean. They play dirty. It's part of their policy. So do you feel comfortable commenting on like some of this and what, what they sure. do? I, and I've talked about it. I talked about it on Alex Gibney's uh, show, uh, Going Clear, on HBO. And I talked about it with uh, Leah Remini on her show. Um, it's pretty constant. They're, they're always trying to destroy me online with a lot of smeary garbage uh and they have subjected me to the kind of operations that they have run against paulette cooper and and leah remini and i mean the one i told leah about was that uh, they actually hired an out of work reporter to pretend that he was working on a story 
that my wife was a terrorist. This was this was to get her bosses to fire her. This is, I mean, it's the same kind of scummy, strange stuff they were pulling in the seventies against Paulette Cooper. And the reason is that L. Ron Hubbard laid this all out in a in a series of policies that he wrote between nineteen fifty five and nineteen sixty seven, and he 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 spells out how to destroy people. Yeah. And one of them is to create lies about them and, and that they've committed crimes and to sue them for no reason. It's all spelled out. Well, Hubbard died in 1986, and they consider him source. And so they can't change what he wrote. So this is one of the most interesting things about Scientology is what it was doing in the 60s, what it was doing in the 80s, it's still doing today because they can't change the playbook. So, yeah, they're constantly um, smearing me and Leah and Mike online and then they will do in in real life operations on occasion uh it kind of comes and goes and I, I had one naysayer in one of my last videos that i did with karen de la carrière was like no they don't have international flight uh i don't know some way of tapping into the flights or knowing when people are going to and from and stuff like that is that is that accurate oh yeah no, we've we've we there are people that have come out of Scientology that did that kind of work and have talked about it. That that they know where you're flying. You know, they they will have employees, uh, unfortunately, at credit card companies and phone companies, and they track people. It's it's really a shame that the government allows them to get away with it. But um, their their information systems are are really top notch. They hire former De Department of Justice people. They hire uh, former cops. And um, yeah, they've got whole offices that do nothing but track people like Karen and Ron, Rama Scavage got it almost worse than anybody in the last few years. Mike Rinder, Leah Remini, uh, all, you know, just constantly they have whole wings devoted to gathering information on us and, and trying to make sure where we are. I remember one time. Derek, I went out to Los Angeles to see my, by the way, they sent twice, they sent a private investigator to intimidate my mother out in California. And I was visiting her and um, there was this local controversy where she lived, where there was a, a school district that refused to stop. They, they were, they would not stop praying in the public school, public school district. The, the, the school board refused to stop praying during the meetings and it had become a local controversy and it had gone to court mm -hmm. and they were going to have their next big meeting. And my mom was just like, you want to go see what they do? And I said, sure, this sounds fun. So she and I went down to this, this school board just to see what was going on. And it was so packed. We couldn't even get in. So we said, forget it. Went back to her house. I went to LA the next day and checked into a hotel uh, before flying home. And I got a call on my hotel room phone you know nowadays you're so used to everything coming in on your cell phone yeah my hotel room phone call phone rang i picked it up and it was freedom magazine scientology's investigative magazine and they wanted to know why i had gone with my mother to the school board hearing and i realized what happened was they think they know everything about you and it had freaked them out why my mother and I had decided to go look at this local political controversy just for the fun of it. And they were so freaked out. David Miscavige must have been screaming at them because normally they do not like to call me up. They do not like to ask me questions. They must have had just like, oh, we got to call this guy and ask him. It was such a joke. It was crazy. And I realized that's, that's one way you drive them crazy is do things that they can't, they don't predict. What the heck? So you're, if I, I mean, to be fair, you're constantly in a way looking over your shoulder somewhat. You're kind of like, all right, well, let me just being uh, aware that you have enemies. And they're I, just, I, you know, I just take basic precautions. And yeah, I mean, you just have to assume that if somebody you don't know is approaching you in a, in a way, you've got to think about it. And it's a hassle. But I figure, you know, it's I, I have a front row seat to one of the most amazing stories going on, and there are certain things that come with it. So, you know, they it's not fun. Believe me, it's not fun being smeared every day online. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think people know that if it's coming from the Church of Scientology, it's garbage. 
And and so that's that's one thing I always try to keep in mind is people understand. I really appreciate this. This is so good. So for those who are tuning in now, uh, we're almost up to 200 people. Um, I want you guys to know we were talking about Danny Masterson and his case and what's happening now. What do you think is going to happen? Because you, you've already explained to us that he was charged for three accounts of rape. The potential of life could be on the table. Um, we don't know if he's guilty, but if it goes out that he is, what, where do you see this going for Scientology? Well, I think, I think the, uh, as long as Danny rolls the dice and decides to go to trial and not seek a plea, uh, it's going to be a nightmare for Scientology. You know, even if, you know, I don't know what the verdict is going to be. You never know with a jury, but I mean, six, eight weeks of testimony about, not just about Danny, but about Scientology. This is a nightmare for Scientology. Also, I really believe that other agencies are watching. I think that if Danny is convicted, I think it will allow some other agencies to take a look at some uh, obstruction of justice evidence. Um, it's hard to predict that because, you know, we've been looking for something like that for so many years. But I, I know there are federal agents who are looking into Scientology. They're, they obviously, no, no charges have been filed. They haven't made any moves. But I know there are from some federal agencies that are keeping an eye on what's going on. And at some point, you know, there, there are so many, in, you know, people that have come out and talked about how their lives have been ruined, their families have been ripped apart, they've been financially extorted. At some point, you have to wonder when is the government going to step in? I think it's a difficult thing for them to do right now, particularly, you know, people always ask, what about the IRS tax exemption? That obviously helps Scientology keep going. You know, the IRS has been decimated in recent decades. It just, it's just not in a position to take on a big fight with Scientology. But as Scientology weakens and as this litigation goes forward, you know, maybe the federal government will finally be in a position to take a hard look at Scientology. It's hard to know. Yeah, I, I'll say this. The Leah Remini series at the end, they have that really interesting dialogue about some of the rape victims and things and having some professionals, even police officers, taking a look and going, how do we investigate a cult like this that's bubbled? It's protecting itself from the outside world. And you're trained as a, a cult member to like you've literally brainwashed and manipulated their mind to such a way they don't even know that they're being uh, treated this way or abused and whatnot. It's only till you've had enough. And sometimes that switch goes off and you go, hold on, that's it. Like, um, uh, you know, uh, Mike Render, he says it all the time. Like, finally, he's doing everything he can to satisfy David and to keep Scientology good. And then all of a sudden he gets that phone call. You mother, you know, you're done. I'm kicking you out. Like, and he's like, finally, like, what's the point? Like my family, they don't want anything to do with me. He literally kicked me out. I might as well go the other way. And when he did, I'm glad people like him exist. So I hope, like you said, other agencies open the door to this. Look closely at this cult, as I hope many other cults, um, and find ways to get better at dealing with this stuff. You know, I just I don't know what you think, if you think that's going to happen, because. Well, it's very difficult. Uh, one of the things that makes things hard for Scientology for uh, law enforcement is that, you know, we have people who have come forward in recent years with horrific tales of child abuse, child sexual abuse, um, all of it getting swept under the rug, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, often it'll be 20 years after the incident. And, you know, you feel for the person and, and I try to publicize what they're saying, but that makes it very hard for law enforcement. Uh, there was a woman who came forward recently who had terrible stories about how she'd been, you know, she was an employee of a church of Scientology at 11, which is not a, that, not that unusual. Right. And one of the older staff members had abused her. The problem was she, she was now in her late twenties or something. And she couldn't even remember the name of the people there because she was, uh, you know, actually this, there was an earlier incident when she was like a five or six. So this is what makes it so difficult for law enforcement is they often don't hear about things in time. The other thing is that, yeah, I mean, they know full well that if they try to do any kind of action, they're going to be facing the full force of David Miscavige's legal team, which has an unlimited budget. 
I mean, this is what happens when we watch people try to sue is that uh, if you've ever been in court, you know that eventually even the most sort of unreasonable parties will, will do the math and say, let's figure out a settlement because this is just costing us too much. Scientology never makes that calculation. They're like, okay, how do we delay this now? How do we mess up this case now? What does it cost? It doesn't matter. Just pay it. Yeah. And so you have, you know, the scorched earth legislate litigation that, you know, even judges are like, you're filing what now? I mean, it's crazy. And so they, Mike Render put it best to me. He said, look, here's the thing. If you're a middle manager at the IRS, or the Department of Justice or whatever, and you're trying to decide whether to really pursue this case, you literally have to make up your mind. Are you ready for this to be the rest of your career? Because it will be. So, because we see other religious organizations being charged for the same things all the time. I remember last year, the year before, there was a small church in Los Angeles that was federally charged because they were smuggling in people from Mexico to, to do the, all the work at the church to keep the lights on. Scientology does that all the time. They've been doing that for years in Florida. They bring in all these Russians. The first thing they do is confiscate their passports. They abuse religious visas. There's so much evidence. So it's not that there's not evidence or that it's not going on. It really comes down to which law enforcement agency has the interest and the will to dig into this stuff. Oh, and, it, and that's why I, I, I really have respect for Judge Charlene Olmedo, that she she's being fair to both sides. You know, Danny's going to get a fair trial, but she is taking the time to learn the issues and learn the vocabulary in a way other judges don't. Wow. Thank you for that. Stop scamming, man. Thank you for the uh, super chat, my friend. I really appreciate you popping up a lot lately. I have an inkling that the belig is it belligerent? belligerent Sea Org folk believe they're helping the world in an amazing way. Do they, for instance, believe that by dutifully practicing, they can rebalance the universe and create a utopia? You think they really believe that? Yeah, I mean, all Scientologists do, not just Sea Org. I mean, they all talk about that they're, you know, I'm just trying to help my fellow man. I'm just trying to make a better world. You know, Hubbard had talked about a world with no war, a world with no insanity. And, you know, superficially, they will talk about, you know, they're just looking forward to when Scientology can create a better environment, a new civilization. They talk about creating a new civilization. I say superficially because really Scientology is built on narcissism. Like, like I said, you're, you're, you're being asked about you. You're being about your role in the universe. And I think that they talk about helping other people, but to a large extent, it's about their own conceptions about themselves. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it, it is kind of amazing that they can keep a Sea Org worker year after year working 365 days a year for pennies an hour, still convinced that this is somehow benefiting the world. When if they could just get outside and look around, they realize nobody outside Scientology really cares about what Scientology is doing. It's, it's having zero effect on the rest of the world. And some of them, when they come out, they're really shocked to learn that. They really did believe they were making a difference in the world. And you, they come out and they're like, you mean nobody cares about Scientology? No, it's, you know, it, it, it has a much larger impact than it deserves because of the celebrities, because of the secretiveness, because of the wacky space opera beliefs. What other 20,000 member organization commands this kind of interest or press, almost none. You know, that reminds me of that, uh, that Tom Cruise video on YouTube that everyone has seen, I'm sure. They're like, this guy's crazy. This one right here, the uh, Tom Cruise Scientology video uncut. Now, I'm not actually gonna play the, the video, but uh, I wanted everyone to kind of peep. If you haven't seen this, if you, you really, really should check it out. It's going through the ads right now. But he is a believer. This guy actually thinks, holy moly, like he's saying, like, you look at this car crash, you get out of the car. You know why? Because you know you're the only one who can help them. And you're thinking, the guy just got in a wreck. Who, Like, you're the only one who can help him? What are you, uh, uh, EMT? You know how to resuscitate someone? I mean, like, what? No, you're the only one who could change the world. And it's mind-boggling. Look at his eyes. I mean, this guy's obsessed. He's so into it. 
He's well, to give you to give you a little background on that video, um, Cruz was brought into Scientology and when he started dating Mimi Rogers in 1986, uh. just a few months after L. Ron Hubbard had died, and he got into it so quickly that he and Mimi were married uh, in 1987 on one of Scientology's holiest days on the calendar, May 9th, which is Dianetics Day. Um, he was with her for three years, and then Scientology convinced him to, to dump her because he had fallen in love with Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman then, uh, she, she is the daughter of a, a famous Australian psychologist, so she had to be convinced to get into Scientology, and she embraced it. She worked. I've been told she got all the way to OT2 in only two years. She must have been doing Scientology every day. She must have been totally into it. But between 1990 and 1992, she soured on it, probably mainly because of Miscavige. And so in 1992, she pulled away from the church and she pulled the, uh, Tom with her. Now, we none of us knew this until years later. But from 1992 until 2000, when they finally broke up, Tom Cruise was being kept at, at arm's length from Scientology by Nicole. And it drove Miscavige crazy. I've, I've written about the spy he had in their household to make sure that Scientology knew what was going on. They finally broke up in 2000. Once they did, Miscavige said, look, job one, we got to get Tom back in. So between 2000 and 2004, he was going through intense auditing, being spun up and turned into the most gung-ho Scientologist in the world. By 2003, they were getting ready to kind of unleash him on the world. He, The first thing he did was he attended the opening of a new facility in Missouri, of all places, in July 2003. And then in um, uh, 2004, he went to the only time he ever went to an ideal organ opening in Madrid, Spain. He not only, Tom not only went to this opening, he gave a speech in Spanish. I'm the only one that's ever published that thing on, on wow. a website. And um, anyway, then Miscavige wanted to recognize him for this new Tom Cruise and how, so that's what that was about, was in October 2004 at their annual IAS gala, they normally give out a freedom, a couple of freedom medals to recognize super Scientologists and Miscavige decided to give Tom the Freedom Medal of Valor, a special large medal. And this was gonna happen in England at, at, at East Grinstead, England. And so in order to really turn this into an event, they created this 35-minute video. This, this interview in the black turtleneck is only yeah. part of it. There's actually a larger video where they talk about how Tom Cruise is the greatest Scientologist of all time, and he's been all over the world. He's met leaders, and, and it's, all, it's all playing to this Mission Impossible theme. <laughs> and, then, and then they played this nine-minute video of Tom. So this was supposed to be like a treat for other Scientologists to show them what Miscavige knew, that Tom was now the most hardcore, enthusiastic. And that's what this video is. It was never supposed to be seen by the general public. It was only supposed to be shown at that one event to celebrate that Tom was now the most kick-ass Scientologist in the world. And yeah. then the plan was to really release him on the world to become Scientology's ambassador and that, that was a few months later in early 2005. And that's what led to the disaster of the Matt Lauer interview on the Today Show and jumping on Oprah's couch and all that. And it was it totally backfired on them. Tom just looked like a complete lunatic. That video wasn't leaked for a few more years until the year 2008 and led directly to the anonymous movement turning its attention on Scientology when Scientology tried to censor that video. Oh man, the end when he's laughing obnoxious, like <laughs> and I'm, woo, and he's all into it. Oh my gosh, he was really, really, really into that. Well, um, I guess we'll see where this case this case goes at this time. There's always something being published by you. Like I want everyone to know, make sure you guys go check out his blog. You Tonyortega.org. Make sure you go look at his blog, subscribe, check out the material. Tons of information here. You can get his book as well on Amazon, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. And uh, you go into how Scientology tried to destroy Paulette Cooper. Uh, it's on Kindle, uh, ebook, if you will, audio book, on Audible, paperback. You can get it on CD if you still have a CD player, knowing how the world is now headed. 
And uh, I have a Patreon, you guys. If you want to help support, you can join the Patreon. And uh, you can write me questions. You want me to ask scholars. You want to private message me. You can do that. Or just to help the show, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So, Tony, um, oh, here we go. Any final words? Someone out there is interested in looking more into this. What, what, what would you recommend? You know, i just like you to come by and join the conversation every morning, 7 a.m., TonyOrtega.org. We've got a new story every day, and we're following not just the Danny Masterson case, but several other uh, uh, prosecutions and civil litigation. And I try to have the latest news uh, and much more detail than you get from the other press. And uh, I'm very fortunate because there's a lot of very knowledgeable former Scientologists that were in the church for 20, 30 years who are part of our community and can answer people's questions. So come on by 7 a.m. Tony Ortega.org and join the fun. Sounds like fun, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you guys tuning in. And if you want to know more, you know, actual knowledge about real things and it's not just about Xenu, make sure you come check me out. Don't forget, we are Mythvision. <laughs>